We welcome you to Cornerstone Baptist. We're glad you're here. This morning we are in the end of Luke chapter 13. And we get to a section where we may get a little bit confused. And I'll just throw a few of the things out at us right here at the beginning, and then we will try to deal with them as we think about them in the passage. But did Jesus come to bring peace? And think about that question. Is Jesus gentle and lowly? And you think, well, yeah, of course. But then the passage that we are in this morning, Jesus says, they came to cast fire on the earth. I mean, he's just a, a pyromaniac. And then a couple of verses later, he says, I came not to give peace, but division. So why did Jesus say that? What does Jesus mean? Where are we going with that? And that's what we'll be looking at as the morning goes on. Let's take our hymnals, turn to hymn number 79 as we begin. 79. To God be the glory, great things he has done. Number 79. Let's stand as we sing this. <laughs> God be the glory, great things he hath done, so loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people Thank you. 
Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the place that he that he plays in our lives now and our hopes for all eternity. Thank you for the changes he makes in our life, not only forgiveness, but giving us a new heart and transforming us to be more and more like him. I pray that we cooperate with you in that process. Thank you for Cornerstone Baptist and for your work in us and through us and changing us and then in reaching the people around us. We ask for your continued work, even this morning as we point to you through our words and our worship and then as we go this week and work for you, not to earn anything, but to reflect our gratefulness, to reflect you and our love for you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So we do have Bible studies Sunday afternoon. We usually bring a little bit of lunch and then divide up into our different groups. So we'd invite you to be a part of that. Friday and Saturday, there's a few carloads going to North Conway. Um, those that are going, we're going to meet here at church just a hair before 10 o'clock. And we'll try to leave at 10 um, as, as we go. So those of you who have registered, just meet here. Notice that one of the missionaries in June has dropped off of the schedule. And they are not able to come. So just that frees us up more. But that week we'll be busy anyway, preparing for Vacation Bible School. You can be inviting people to that now. Understand they won't remember, but just be... Uh, giving them a little bit of a heads up now for them to be thinking about and then continue to invite them to that ministry. It will be for all ages. We'll have adult class, teen class, all the way down to nursery, to nursery class. Would encourage you to consider your ongoing ministries here at church. The, the sheet that we have handed out before, and I believe there's some in the back about opportunities for service. I believe those are still accurate about members, non-members, so we would again invite you to be involved in ministry here. The sign up, the calendar in the back gives some crucial activities that the church is going to be involved in, and then usually we put our name on the Saturday if we're going to volunteer to clean church that week, and it would have to be done by Saturday each week. So we'd invite you to, to check on that. There is some cleanup to do around outside the church, the lawn and things. If you get a chance to do some raking or cleaning of branches, you can do that. And before we know it, the lawnmower will have to be started. And so, so those are all responsibilities that we can be involved in. Any other announcements, Dick? Yes, uh, there'll be a membership class starting in July. Uh, we'll go with the, uh, probably the second, uh, the first, yeah, we'll go with the first Sunday of July, and there will be a sign up in the back for people that would like to attend that. Okay, membership class beginning in July. Our missionaries this week are Travis and Becky Gravely. Reminder about what their ministry is. He is, Travis is in the, the home office of Baptist Missions. Um, they had spent time in Romania as church planters. 
now Travis is in charge of church relations, which means he's kind of the go-between between between the mission board and we as churches. And then he's also in charge of enlistment, which means that he talks with, with anybody who's interested in missions to see if missions is even an option that God has for them. And then whether Baptist admissions would be good fit for them or not. And then he has to work them through all of the application process and, and the, the whole enlistment process. And then the, the missionaries that are on deputation raising their support to go to the field, uh, they also answer to Travis. So he's got quite a broad ministry. Our sister church today is London Dairy Baptist down in New Hampshire. <coughs> And we are praying for them today. Ushers, come please. We'll receive the offering. Dear Father, we pray for the church in London, Derry. Thank you that that church was started in a similar way to this one. And that you have been using them to reach into the community and to make disciples who are built on Jesus and on your word. I pray for them to continue to be effective in that ministry. I pray for Travis and Becky Gravely. Thank you that Becky and Kara are involved in the community and reaching their neighbors for Christ as well as in church and in other ministries. And then I pray for Travis as he's involved with the mission board in representing the mission to churches like ours as well as as being in contact with hundreds of different people who are interested in missions and trying to create an interest in missions and then getting them from the pew to the mission field. I pray that you would help him to have wisdom and encourage him, but then work through him for your glory. I pray for we as a church family that we would look for opportunities to share Christ as well as intentionally grow people in the gospel and in their discipleship. I pray for this offering that it would be used for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Trust that is your testimony that the Lord Jesus leads you and you are following him. We're going to read in our Bibles this morning from Luke chapter 12. We'll have Joe come. We'll be reading starting in verse 49 down through the end of the chapter. Luke 12, starting in verse 49. Good morning. Pastor indicated would be in the book of Luke, chapter 12, starting in verse 49, down to the end of the chapter, which is 59. Follow along if you would like. I am come to send fire on the earth, and what will I, if it be already kindled? But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straightened till it be accomplished? Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth, I tell you, nay, but rather division. For from henceforth there shall be five and one house divided, three against two, and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son, and the son against the father. The mother against the daughter, and the daughter against the mother. The mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And he said also to the people, when you see a cloud rise out of the west, straight away you say, there comes a shower, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, there will be heat, and it 
and it cometh to pass. You hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern this time? Yea, and why even of yourselves judge ye not what is right? When thou goest with thine adversary to the magistrate, as thou art in the way, give diligence that thou mayest be delivered from him, lest he, be ha lest he hail thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and the officer cast thee into prison. I tell thee, thou shalt not depart thence till thou hast paid the very last mite. May the Lord add blessing to his reading of his word. We'll work our way through that in just a moment, but let's remind ourselves through our hymnals 365 that our hope is in our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, in the price that he paid for us, 365. You can remain seated. started. Um, yeah, Children's Church can be dismissed at this time. Last week we restarted the Gospel of Luke. Um, we had taken a break for our Gospel-shaped outreach, and now we're back in chapter 12, finishing up chapter 12 this morning. Uh, just a, a reminder, and this will be fairly crucial as we figure out where we are in the Gospel of Luke, that the first few chapters were introducing Jesus to us. Then in chapter 4, verse 14, all the way through chapter 9, verse 50, Jesus was ministering up in Galilee. And then in chapter 9, verse 51, we're told that Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. He is on his way to make the payment once and for all for our sin. Jesus is getting heavier and heavier pushback. Uh, the religious leaders are becoming more antagonistic all the time. Uh, what does the follower of Jesus look like when there is opposition and Jesus is giving really more and more clear instruction about this? The disciple of Jesus is cross-bearing, uh, self-denying, joyful, but that joy is anchored in Jesus himself, God-fearing, not man-fearing, and not uh, fearing what we may be missing out on in this world. 
but treasuring Jesus and trusting Jesus, wholly following and totally dependent on Jesus. Here in chapter 12, the first few verses, we're talking about not being distracted by fear of persecution or by false religion. Then in verse 13 and following, not being distracted by material goods. Boy, isn't that possible to do? You know, just trying to keep gas in the tank and food in the, in the fridge can really distract us from following Christ. Is that part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, is taking responsibility um, to, to work with God and providing for our own needs so we're not a burden to others? Absolutely. But don't be distracted by that. And then in chapter 12, verse 35, that we looked at last week, Jesus is returning. We need to be ready because we are going to have to answer to him. This week, verse 49, there's no transitional word in there. This is still the same theme working its way through where the follower of Christ must expect friction even from those closest to him and his family, those that he operates most closely with. It's interesting, Jesus says he came to burn the place up, he came to set, up, set this place on fire. Interesting that some interpret that, well, yeah, of course, the Holy Spirit's coming with these tongues of fire and that's what he's talking about. I don't think so. This whole context is that of judgment. So Jesus is coming to burn the place up, verse 49, and he says, I wish, I wish that fire were already kindled. I wish it were already taken care of, but, but there's still time to go. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, Jesus himself bore, verse 50, the judgment of all who trust in him. He says he has this baptism to be baptized with. He himself is going to be immersed in God's wrath in the place of those who trust in him. And then those who will not trust in Jesus can expect this horrifying judgment to come. Let's work our way through this. So verse 49, I am come to send fire and I wish it were already kindled. So did Jesus come to give peace? Verse 51, did you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather division. So are Christmas cards wrong to promise peace on earth? Um, what we have to say, and, and here's the way I'll say it, is that we can't say any less than that Jesus came to bring peace. But we must say more than that. We must qualify that peace. He came to bring peace. What kind of peace? Peace with whom? Um, what does that look like? What will it take to experience that peace. We have to say more than that, there are qualifications. So in verse 49 through 53, Jesus' first main point came to bring judgment and to bear judgment, two sides of the same coin. You either bear the judgment yourself or you allow Jesus to bear the judgment for you. Jesus came to bring judgment. I came to cast fire on the earth and I wish it were already kindled. Um, there's several clues in understanding what this means, and we'll try to, try, try to see those as time goes on. So the sub-point here is that Jesus came to bring judgment, in verse 49. Um, the point is still being ready for Christ returning um, in the previous verses that we looked at last week. So he's still talking about this coming judgment and he came to bring judgment. Why did he come the first time? Verse 49, he came to cast fire on the earth. I came to, um, I think I put it in your notes. The order, the word order is fire. I came to throw. Uh, the emphasis is on fire. This is, this is, this is a pyromaniac where Jesus is, throwing fire of judgment on the earth. Is Jesus gentle and lowly? We went through that book a couple years ago. Absolutely. 
He comes graciously and mercifully loving us, pouring his life into us. He compassionately came to seek and to save that which was lost. The key verse of Luke, of, of Luke is Luke 19.10. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. But what happens when a perfectly holy and righteous God meets a sinful world? So just picture God up in heaven, perfectly holy, perfectly righteous. He comes to earth and he comes to a sinful earth. What happens? Sparks fly. Um, you may have played around with, uh, I was thinking the other, the other day of, it's probably fourth grade, that in science class we made a volcano, Mount Popocatépetl. Still remember that. Isn't it? Teachers don't give up. Sometimes your students remember words like that. Popocatépetl, where is that? It's in Mexico. An active volcano that, that explodes. Well, we were collecting things to create this volcano. And does anybody have a piece of plywood? And somebody in class had a piece of plywood. Does anybody have some chicken wire? So we have chicken wire at home. So I, I had brought chicken wire. And we then paper mache the thing. And then we did the, the old vinegar and, and bacon soda routine with some food coloring. And, and, and it exploded. What happens when a perfectly righteous holy God meets sin? Sparks fly. The sinners are not happy at that point. And that's what happened when Jesus came. John the Baptist introduced Jesus in this way back in Luke chapter 3. He will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. What did he mean by that, John the Baptist? John, he then explained his winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor, to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with inquenchable fire. Jesus came to bring fire. Jesus would come and judge. And here Jesus is saying exactly the same that John the Baptist did a few years earlier. So when you only consider half of who Jesus is, you get confused. Do you have any complicated friends? That's a, a fun word to think about. It's complicated. Where they will act this way one day and they'll act this way the next day. But then when you put it together, you say, ah, I understand now. You get to know them. Jesus comes to bring peace. We have promised that in Luke 2. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. But then Jesus says, I came to bring division. I came to bring eternal life and to seek and to save the lost at the same time as he says, I came to bring fire. Jesus, you have to see all of who he is. Um, just another verse that we're familiar with, John 3, 17. Uh, Jesus himself is speaking. He says, um, Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Is that true? Absolutely true. But the very next verse says, he that believes in him is not condemned, but he that doesn't believe is condemned already. So, so there's qualifications to the salvation that Jesus came to bring. Well, why is there this distinction? Why is there this division? Jesus then in John chapter 3 verse 19 said, this is the judgment that light came into the world. Men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. So Jesus came to bring judgment to the earth. Just by showing up, Jesus exposed hearts. Just by showing up on this earth and living a perfect life among us and speaking a few words that pointed out how sinful we are, sparks flew. Jesus came to bring judgment and part of the judgment was him just shining light on our sinfulness. So 49b, I wish it were already kindled, is a good way to translate that. Jesus would love for sin and rebellion to be over once for all. But think about this. If, if judgment and rebellion were all over and all finished, 
what would happen to your unsaved friend? Be, it would be impossible for them to come to Christ. God in his mercy is still giving the opportunity for people to come to him. So verse 50, I have a baptism to be baptized with, how I am straightened, I am just, I'm just worked up, I am distressed until this happens. This is the other side of the coin. Jesus came to bring judgment. This is the other side. Jesus came to bear judgment. He came to be immersed into God's wrath. Baptism just means to be immersed. And Jesus is going to be totally held under, you might say, in the wrath of God that we deserved. Why is Jesus so distressed about it? It's because he's going to have to carry our sin and all the penalty of it on himself. But then notice the end of verse 50, until it is accomplished, uh, until it's finished. Um, and we sing the one song that uses these words, until it is accomplished. But then we know that when Jesus was on the cross, the last thing he said is, it is finished. He had accomplished the work he came to do. He came to bear judgment. And that's what he's talking about there in verse 50. So Jesus would be immersed into God's wrath. Now I think that fifth, verse 51, 52, 53 is still a continuation of Jesus saying, I came to bear God's judgment on sin. So how do 51, 52, and 53 fit into this? Do you suppose I came to give peace on the earth? No, rather division. And then for, from here on out, from now on, there will be five in a household divided, three against two, two against three, father divided against the son. Notice, notice though that it doesn't stop there. The son against the father. It's mutual. The mother against the daughter, the daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against the daughter-in-law, the daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law. What causes this division? What causes this division was Jesus bearing judgment. And how do we accept that? It's by grace through faith that we accept the payment Jesus made. And then that makes sparks to fly as well within a family. So people are divided by how they respond to Jesus. Colossians 1 verse 20 says that Jesus makes peace by the blood of his cross. But peace with whom? It, it's the peace of the believer in Jesus with God. But when peace is made with God by a person, now all of a sudden his family feels intimidated and threatened and is angry because now justification has happened. This person has been declared righteous. God has changed their heart. He's changed their direction. And now sparks are flying. Luke chapter 7, we saw in verse 50, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Well, what was the peace? It was this lady's peace with God. In Luke chapter 10, verse 5, if people receive you into their house, Jesus is sending 70 out two by two and saying, go into a town and knock on a door. And if they receive you, say, peace be to this house. But then if they reject you, what do you do? You leave. Your, your purpose at this point is not to create sparks. Your purpose is to, to just offer the peace of God. And that was in chapter 10. Jesus does make peace. Jesus does unify, but how does he do it? We have to qualify that statement by saying he offers faith. He offers peace through faith in his payment for us. Most of us know people who say, I love Jesus. I'm at peace with him. I don't have to answer to you. I answer to Jesus. Meanwhile, they're living in open rebellion to Jesus. They're not at peace with Jesus. They've made peace with themselves 
They've tried to create peace within themselves by just ignoring truth. But Jesus, when he comes into their lives, really makes sparks. You can't say Jesus only came to bring peace, period. You have to say Jesus did not merely come to bring peace. He came to bring judgment as well. So when you have peace with Jesus, through faith in him, he bore your judgment. That faith might divide you from some people. Uh, just make that clear, get it clear in your mind now. Because when that happens, sometimes it surprises new believers. And sometimes it even surprises older believers. Where you say, why are people so mad at me? Well, you trusted Christ. When a follower of Jesus is all in, placing Jesus first, Jesus only, the person's relationships often become very, very clear what the priorities are. Often your family has different priorities for your life than Jesus does. And they'll be glad to let you know what those priorities are. And if you dare to follow Jesus, instead of following your family's priorities, sparks will fly. There will be division. When you say, I am committed to Jesus' church, could we have the family picnic on Sunday afternoon? Sparks will fly. Not every family, but on some families this happens. And, and you can keep going on, on those illustrations about when sparks fly. Jesus knew what would happen when somebody is following him wholeheartedly. From now on, verse 52, from henceforth, there will be this ongoing state of division. If you even dare to think about America, there is division. What is causing the division? Much of America is trying to get rid of God and trying to run the opposite way. And sparks are flying because no matter which way they turn, God gets in the way. And they're really upset about it. And then if we dare to stand up for Christ, then they see us as getting in their way as well. Uh, I, I think, again, the passage is clear. Jesus came to bring judgment and to bear judgment. Part of the judgment that Jesus brought was he turned the lights on. He let us see what true holiness looks like and what our sinfulness really looks like. A few more chapters, Luke chapter 14, we'll get into the same idea again. Another passage, a follower of Jesus must love Jesus the most. Yes, we love our families, we're commanded to love our families, but we love Jesus more. We love Jesus the most. To sum up this section, uh, I'll just quote from back in Luke chapter 2. Baby Jesus being taken into the temple and they run into Simeon. Remember old Simeon, the old guy who had been looking for the Messiah all of his life? And he said this, My eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. And he's praising the Lord. But then Simeon goes on to say this, This child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. Jesus would cause division. He came to bring judgment. He came to bear judgment. And depending on whether we trust Christ's judgment he paid for us or decide to pay for it ourselves, whether we decide to live for him or to live for something else, that will cause division in this world. The second main point is in verses 54 through 56, this illustration of seeing a cloud coming and saying, man, it's going to rain or are feeling the wind from the south and say, man, it's going to get hot. The, the point here is that Jesus' first coming is a clear sign, warning of the judgment to come. Jesus' first coming is a clear sign that warns of 
the judgment to come. And this judgment is looming. It, it's, it's just hanging over our heads. So the illustration Jesus using is that of, of observing the weather. Um, growing up in New York State, the bad weather came from the Southwest. Here in Maine, it's, it's generally more from the east or southeast, you know, is the way the storm patterns. If the, if the wind's coming in a certain direction, you say, oh boy, it's going to storm. In Israel, the Mediterranean, Mediterranean was to the west. If you had a west wind, that moist air coming off the Mediterranean is going to bring a rainstorm. You just knew it. But then if the wind was coming in from the south, what was to the south? Well, the desert was to the south. It's going to be hot today. And they say, it is so clear, isn't it? It only has to happen to you once or twice to see, oh, man, there's a cloud coming in from the west. It's going to rain. Um, you, you, you can figure that out. But he, Jesus says, here I am. I'm standing right in front of you. There's already division because some of you are accepting me and some of you are rejecting me. Some of you are accepting my followers and some of you are antagonistic to my followers. It's so clear. Just open your eyes. Judgment is looming. So that's Jesus' application in verse 56. You hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, yet how is it you do not discern this season, this time, this time of me standing in your midst? A few other times when Jesus used this illustration in Matthew chapter 16, the Pharisees asked Jesus for a sign and Jesus used the illustration of the weather and said, why can't you see it? I've already given you the signs. Luke chapter 11, we had seen uh, back the end of last year that some asked for a sign and, and then Jesus answered, a wicked generation asked for a sign. Why did he call them wicked asking for a sign? It's because the sign was right in front of them. All they had to do was open their eyes. But as we already read from John 3, they didn't like the lights to be turned on because their deeds are evil. In Luke chapter 11, verse 34, the way Jesus puts it is the light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is single focused, your whole eye is full of light. But when your eye is evil, you have a bad eyes, bad eyesight, your body is full of darkness. What is Jesus saying? The problem isn't with the light. The problem was, is with your eyesight. The problem was with the way you see things. So years ago, I told Betsy, we need better light over the pulpit at church. Now, I think the light's fine over the pulpit at church. I think it's your eyesight that now can't be. <laughs> you know? No, I think it's your eyesight. And I got new glasses and I didn't need new lights, okay? <laughs> um, G that's what Jesus is telling them. He's telling them, look, you are able to observe a lot of the things around you and see exactly what's going on. But you look at me and you just get upset. You get look at me and sparks fly. There's division because you will not accept me as the Messiah, as God himself. Can you see Jesus, or are you distracted by the stuff around you? Will you open your eyes and see Jesus? When we see Jesus in his first coming, which we're doing here in the Gospel of Luke, as we read the Gospels, we see Jesus. We see that judgment clouds are looming. And we say, oh boy, a storm's coming. We went through Revelation last year. And we had to say, wow, the storm's coming. Jesus came to bring judgment, to bear judgment, and his coming makes it clear that, that the, the storm clouds are looming. And then the third main point in verses 57 through 59, this looming judgment points to the urgency of reconciling with God now. Make it right with God today. Verse 57, what even of yourselves judge you not what is right? Why can't you make the right decision? So then he gives this illustration. 
when you go with your adversary to the, to the judge, as you're in the way, give diligence that you may be delivered from him, lest he hail you to the judge, and the judge deliver you to the officer, and the officer cast you into prison. I tell you, you will not depart from there until you have paid the very last might, the very last penny. So illustration, settle your debts quickly before you get to the judge. Um, th think of this as your sibling, where you've done something stupid, and your sibling says, I'm telling mom, and they grab you by the ear, and they head off to mom, or, or they just start heading towards mom. You say, man, I better get there first. Or along the way, oh, please, 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 I won't do it again. <laughs> Okay, so you're trying to make it right before you get there because you know if, we, if you make it to mom, you're in trouble. Or the illustration here, you know that you have a big debt to pay and the person that you owe the money to says, look, you've made it clear you're not paying the debt. I'm taking you to the judge. Yeah. And before you get to the judge, you better try to do anything you can to make it right. Because when you get to the judge, you're not only going to have to pay the debt, you're going to have to pay the, the debt plus interest, plus court fees, plus you're going to be in prison, and you're not even going to be able to earn money to pay off the debt. You're going to be in big trouble by then. Do everything you can to settle out of court. If you're guilty, it makes no sense to put off the inevitable. You're going to be held accountable to pay. And that's the illustration Jesus is giving. What is the application Jesus makes? Um, you will not depart there, verse 59, until you have paid the very last mite. How does that apply to the rest of what we've been reading? The, yeah, last week's passage, Jesus is coming back. Be ready for him to come. Make it right before he gets back. In short, we owe a debt. To put off paying that debt results in eternal punishment. Jesus is standing right in front of us. And, and look up here. Jesus is standing right in front of us, holding his hands out, showing the nail prints, saying, I bore that judgment for you. I already paid your debt. What do we do? How do we respond? Do we try to go around him and continue living our life? Or do we say, please forgive me. Make it right. Because once you get to the judge, it's too late. That's the illustration and the application here in these verses. So did Jesus come to give peace? Absolutely he did. And he paid all of the price necessary for that to happen. But if somebody is unwilling to receive that gift, the free gift of Jesus' righteousness and Jesus' forgiveness, then they're in for a cloud of judgment coming. The clouds are looming. It's going to come. It's going to storm. Let's take a few minutes and just review some of these hard teachings. These are hard teachings. When we look at a passage like this, I, we, realize we're often not following Jesus wholeheartedly, fully. Jesus is shaking us. He's grabbing us by the lapels and just giving us a good hard shake. Wake up, judgment's coming. Are you ready? Are you ready for the master's return, 35 through 48? Those that have been given much are gonna be held accountable for much. Three main application points here that I want us to get. The first is that we have to be clear about what following Jesus looks like. What does following Jesus look like? 
Jesus didn't come to make your life easier. In fact, if you follow Jesus, it may divide your family. That's hard to swallow. But the reason it divides your family is not because you made a bad choice, it's because your family doesn't like the choice you made to follow Jesus. Now make sure, make sure that it's you following Jesus that is causing the friction, not you being a jerk. Not you doing your own thing. Not you throwing mud at them. Make sure that you are following Christ fully. Jesus is not concerned about your earthly success as much as he is you putting him first. Maybe an application of this is, are you experiencing division in your life? If you're not, could it, maybe two reasons. One is, is everybody around you obviously a believer who's following Christ fully? Maybe you should make some unsafe friends and try to share the gospel with them. But another reason might be that Christ hasn't made a difference in your life and you live in the way the unsaved people are living. And that's why there's no division. When we follow Christ, sparks fly. Second application, seek to understand what God wants and then do it. Seek to understand what God wants and then do it. So many times we see the clouds in the sky and we pour our lives into avoiding the rain or avoiding the heat. Uh, we pour our lives into earthly pursuits, but how much energy are we putting into our relationship with God? If you've been neglecting God and time with him, it's time to cut back on some other things. That is really hard to discern what that means. I understand that. It may make some people mad when you say, you know what? God is more important to me than you are. It may make your spouse mad when you say that. Are you to love your spouse? Absolutely, it's a command. Are you to pour your all into your spouse? Well, qualify that. Qualify that. Put your all into following Christ and understand that may make sparks fly. You know, the best marriages are the ones that put 100% into Christ. Third, take action today, don't wait. We came, Betsy and I got here at 8.20 or so this morning. It wasn't a bad morning. When most of you got here for Sunday school, it was pouring rain. Where did that come from? Um, the, the rains of God's judgment are going to come down. If you've never trusted Christ, today is a good time. Today's the best time. But believer, we will stand before Christ not to receive judgment, but to receive rewards, to receive commendation for living faithfully for him. And how many rewards will I lose, will be cast aside because I have not turned now to following Christ fully. So as we saw last week, Jesus is returning, ready or not, you ever say that when you're playing hide and seek? Ready or not, here I come. Well, Jesus is saying that to us. To whom much is given of him shall much be required. Am I re-following Christ, responding by wholehearted faith and wholehearted obedience, no matter what? No matter what happens, even with the people around me, how upset they may get at me. This is difficult. This is difficult. But Jesus himself says, I came to cast fire. I came to cause division. And make sure it's not you that's causing the division. It's not your job to cast fire. It's not your job to light the world on fire. That's Jesus' job. Your job 
is to trust him and follow him fully. Take our hymnals as we finish up. Hymn number 662. 662. Rise up, O men of God, have done with lesser things. 662. Let's stand and sing all three verses. trusted Christ, this morning would be a good time. We are all sinners. We've fallen short of the glory of God. We deserve God's judgment. We will experience God's judgment. Jesus came to bring it. Unless we accept the free gift that he already paid for us. He bore God's judgment for us. Trust him this morning. Believer, are you living as if Jesus is the most important person in your life? What does that look like in your life? Is there division? That isn't necessarily a bad thing. That may merely be reflecting the fact that you are following Christ in a gracious, loving, gentle way, but you are following Christ and the people around you uh, don't like it and it makes sparks fly. Don't be afraid to live faithfully for Christ today. Dear Father, help us to live this way. Help us to see clearly. Help us to live with Christ right in front of our eyes so that we follow him and nothing else. Help us to do it for your glory and not our own. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.